Welcome to the NDIS Property Australia podcast. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hi, everyone. My name's Matthew. I'm here from the office uh, with Kim from Inclusive Living. Uh, We're just going to be talking about their company, uh, their products, and how they they kind of fit into SDA builds and SDA homes. Um, So hi, Kim. Um, Could you just uh, tell us a bit, bit about yourself? Thanks very much, Matt. My name's Kim Johnston from Inclusive Liver. Uh, We are the supplier of height adjustable lifting systems, which go into kitchens, bathrooms and bedrooms. And they are also being utilised in the SDA environment at the moment. Our products include height adjustable systems for worktops, wall cabinet lifts, island benches. So many, many different areas have been utilised for the kitchen space. In regards to the bathroom, height adjustable wash basin brackets, In regards to the bedroom, height adjustable uh, electric wardrobe lifting systems. So we supply many different products which meet standards, but also meet the needs or the uh, meet the needs of the clients and changing environment. Excellent, awesome. So I'm assuming it's mostly NDIS participants that you work with in terms of designing these products. We actually work with a variety of people uh, for the SDA environment. Uh, We work with um, architects, interior designers, builders, developers. Um, We work with joinery companies, many different people that are involved in the process. That could also include allied health professionals, SDA consultants or or assessors. There is many people that are involved in the process of the SDA builds. So all of those people we speak with, touch base with, uh, work with, Uh, provide a lot of information and knowledge and experience uh, in in relation to our height adjustable systems. Awesome, because I can imagine uh, in that process of the design, it's very important kind of getting a lot of feedback from the right groups, because as I can imagine, a lot of builders would kind of be out of touch with the actual realities of living in an SDA home. And... um, you know, how, how products can actually be used in the home and, uh, you know, what sort of drawbacks that maybe a design which doesn't take into account the, the specific needs of, say, participants in the house, um, how that would kind of work out. Could, could you kind of just talk on that and kind of the discrepancy between kind of knowledge between the building industry and the actual end result for participants? Um, yes, Inclusive Living, we've been around for many, many years. We represent the Granberg of Sweden range of products for height adjustability. Um, and we, what we found within the Australian market, because we've had a lot of years in this market, a lot of knowledge and experience we've acquired over a number of those years, and the changing dynamics that are involved, and especially the knowledge and experience that's required for uh, specialised buildings such as supported disability accommodation. Those changing dynamics involve uh, architects and, indi- and designers who are learning some of the new requirements and how important it is to get it right in the first place in regards to the design scope required to meet the NDIS uh, design standard because there is a minimum standard to work towards in each of the number of the categories that they have. And then what we find is that if those particular areas such as the architects and interior designers, that information then flows through to, you know, developers and builders, um, even to the point where it could be joinery companies. There's so many people involved in the process of this and a lot of the people are very, very new to this particular space. So there, there isn't the knowledge, there isn't the experience and, and really understanding why you would select one product over another or why you would do something slightly different than another particular situation 
uh, takes a great deal of experience and knowledge. And, it's, and unfortunately, at the moment, in some of the areas, not all, but some of the areas, because of the lack of knowledge of experience within this space, we're finding that um, there's an awful lot of mistakes that are being made because of uh, a number of yeah. areas. It could be the design, it could be the scope of the design, it could be some builders not understanding how important it is to have fit-for-purpose products yep. which are actually designed uh, to be going into that space and not compromising uh, the integrity of those products for something which may look similar but... Substandard. Yeah, is not meeting the, um, the standards that really the clients and the providers and also the people that have invested in these... Um, homes need so it's a really critical factor so experience is really important what we always say is work with people who know what they're doing so it's a critical area because if not the outcomes are not good so that means that can have an impact on the overall outcomes for the clients the investors everyone involved in the process all stakeholders so it's a critical area to really consider when you're looking at that and that's who we collaborate with. We do a lot of uh, educational work around that, whether it be workshops, meetings, uh, podcasts like today, or various uh, trade shows, many different aspects that we help in the awareness and education of our type of products which go into these types of environments. And just a, a sub-note is that it's not just these SDA environments that we um, supply product into. It is many different areas, including uh, NDIS uh, clients direct into their homes. It could be educational facilities. It could be all sorts of uh, community or communal environments. For example, um, our company was selected to provide, which we did, uh, uh, a number of products for the Disability Royal Commission fit-outs, which are in Sydney and in Melbourne. So awesome. that's an example of who we work with. Excellent. I think that's a pretty good answer. <laughs> Um, so I suppose my next question would be, um, you know, uh, and I kind of touched on it beforehand that in a lot of houses, a that that an investor might buy, the investor themselves or whoever's uh, deciding to build an SDA house might not be aware of kind of what goes into uh, an SDA design and um, what can potentially go into it um, and what the variations that exist in the industry are. So how would uh, listeners, I suppose, gain more insight into your products and to learn more about um, the ways in which you would, I suppose, the ways in which you set yourself apart in terms of the industry and your, and your products and how they integrate into homes? Um, really good question because um, one of the things that we often get phone calls from people who are uh, looking for facilities, who are wanting to invest in facilities, and really to get an idea of what they should be looking for, as you pointed out then, in particular investments when they're wanting to review everything that needs to be looked at. I always encourage them to review the uh, SDA uh, design standard, have a look through and really understand what each of the categories that people are building towards. It could be improved livability, uh, robust, fully accessible, High physical supports are your main categories. Mm. And, and to understand each of those categories of how important it is to get the right design scope in there and to meet those particular standards. And if they have got an overall uh, better understanding of that, then they have the ability then to talk with groups of people such as yourselves as a starting point to, to ask very important and relevant questions of which standards and why they're going to be investing in those particular areas and which standards that they need to really review because of that. Um, the, the best example I can give you is that there is generally a minimum design standard which is required. For example, you have a minimum design standard for kitchens. Hmm. Um, then you have a minimum design standard for bathrooms which also encompasses 
a number of uh, Australian standards such as the 1428, 4.1 and 2s. So there's a number of factors which really are very, very important to consider when you're yep. investing in SDAs. Absolutely. And then you also then have, from the minimum standard, what, we've, what we're finding at the moment is that a number of um, investors, a number of people that are, uh, are building these particular areas, building a number of these particular in these environments is that they are looking to do more than just the basic standard because yep. in some areas the basic standards or the minimum requirements just don't seem to be cutting the mustard shall we say yes. not working yep. as well as they should do so um, and that's why it's important for them to have an understanding of what a, a minimum requirement is for each of those levels um, and then what is outside that scope and what can they do better to make a, a much better and more enticing environment um, for participants and what would that cost to them and why would they do it? Yeah, because I feel like uh, in a lot of uh, our investors and what we tend to emphasise is the need for education and mm. to learn more about what the individual categories of SDA design are and obviously how that kind of factors into the lifestyles of the, the participants which uh, experience that SDA house as their lived experience. Um, so learning, I feel like, yeah, learning more about the actual individual requirements so then you can kind of mm. decide, hey, how, how can I, I suppose, improve this experience in this setting or this type of SDA house um, moving forward? And um, so just going forward off that, um, I just wanted to talk about kind of the uh, variations that would be possible because uh, a lot of um, a lot of investors, they might not actually know um, kind of what can be included or what can be uh, put into an SDA property as part of, I suppose, improving it to make it more um more desirable to live in um, for a participant because obviously from the investors side of things they want to make sure that the if 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 the participants are happy they're more likely to stay in the house they're more likely to have a better lifestyle um, which works out for everyone um, so could you kind of uh, maybe talk about kind of the budget of adding additional variations to the house mm. and because um, obviously one of the goals there is to future proof the house as well um, to make sure it's desirable um, for many years to come, that the participant, it, it's suited to their lifestyle. Um, they don't, they're not sitting there thinking, oh, well, if I had this extra option in my house, I, you know, I, you know, my lifestyle would be better. So could you kind of talk about kind of the budget um, and uh, potential variations? What's that likely to cost for the, um, an investor? So that's an, another great question because it's, it's one that's, being asked all the time. What we're finding is that the, a lot of builders are putting in, as we mentioned, the minimal standards of what they need to do. And some of that is just not working for a lot of clients. Um, and there is also a part in the standard which is, is called general best practice recommendations. So doing a little bit more than, than just the basic standards. One of the, the best examples and a number of the rooms if we went through each of the standards. For example, the kitchen. We have a very minimal area um, which is, requires uh, height adjustability. And what we're finding is that a lot of clients are unable to use the kitchen because uh, the height adjustable worktop systems are not extended to really important areas such as the sink area or the use for the cooktop area. Now, when you're in a wheelchair um, or a seated position, you need to be able to get direct front access, ergonomically seated. But if you don't have the ability to do that, um, then that makes it really difficult for the people to actually use that space mm, in a yep. very safe manner. Example is the height adjustable worktop system. Minimum standard is 900 wide. If you increase that to even something in the vicinity of um, you know 2400 wide or even a little bit less you're only you're going to maybe add you know an extra two or three grand on top of that 
to make a whole section where you can actually add a cooktop and a sink and that whole space to be very, very accessible friendly. Um, and that makes an enormous amount of difference. It's a difference between someone being able to use the kitchen properly and easily and in a safe manner or not being able to do that at all. Now, if yeah. you look at high physical support and people will say, well, most people in that, who are in that category can't use that type of space. Well, on many occasions, that may be the case, but on other occasions, on many other occasions, that's not the case. But also, uh, in terms of um, the next category down, um, fully accessible, that certainly is most definitely used in a lot of times uh, for the kitchen area. So from that perspective, um, if you're investing in something, you've got high, you're doing high physical supports, if you can't meet the needs of that client in that particular situation, then you may have to turn around and be able to get the uh, clients from who are in uh, the category of fully accessible to meet the needs. So then you've covered all your bases in that area of yep. being able to use utilise that kitchen a lot better. Another area which has is, is been talked about on so many occasions is that um, the areas of the bedroom where we have a, an electric height adjustable uh, wardrobe lifting system. So that means at a touch of a button, the clients can uh, utilise the, the system to bring their clothes down to an accessible area, get off what they need off the rail and then put it back up. Yep. That means that they can access they can utilise that whole space of their wardrobe a lot better and then utilise the top section and then the bottom section um, more accessible for other things. So it's, an, it's a really big thing and on many occasions clients have said to me, for some reason or other, these developers don't think that people that live with a disability um, don't like to wear clothes sometimes because <laughs> we actually do. We actually like to be a little bit more fashion conscious than what they really think. Absolutely. We get a lot of feedback from clients, Matt, um, mm. talking about different areas. Uh, we get a lot of feedback um, from their loved ones, from their parents that yeah. have to, yeah, or whoever is involved, making some of those really important decisions of where their children are going to be um, living or mm. their loved ones are going to be living. And they talk about all of these particular areas. Well, we can't mm. really... My loved one can't use the kitchen, they can't use the bathroom, they can't do this, they can't do that. So that's why it's so critical when you look at all of these types of things is... To make sure they're purpose-built. Absolutely. Because yeah. otherwise it's just space which is just essentially going to waste if it's not yeah. uh, built in a way which can be used by the participants inside, then it, yep. it goes to waste essentially. Very much so. And one of the key things is that we... At a inclusive living, there is five key principles that you should always look at, review and work with in these particular areas. But often at the moment, the key areas such as asking yourself, is it accessible? Is it functional? Is it usable? Is it safe? Does it look good? Is it aesthetically pleasing? They're five key factors. But unfortunately at the moment, a number of the four main key factors are being left aside. And yes, some of these facilities, they look terrific, but they're not meeting some of the standards which are really necessary and required by the clients. So they're, they're just examples of each of the areas that investors might want to consider in going, what do we need to make this a lot more desirable? But also look at the factor of this investment is for us is for a long term. So how is, it, how is the participant going to react within these uh, spaces? How are the carers going to be managing within these spaces? Because they play mm -hmm. an integral part Absolutely. as well. Yep. And that's for short, medium and long term because the last thing that clients want to be doing is retrofitting yeah. uh, or upgrading yep. or doing all sorts of things you know, within a few months of that space, because at the end of the it day, it done well in the first place. Yep. yep. What, at the end of the day, what actually happens is we don't know who's coming into the space a lot of the times, or the changing needs and the requirements of that person, the changing needs and the requirements of their equipment, and that's one of the areas that we've also finding that plays an integral part. 
because often clients will not have just one wheelchair. They may have two or three pieces of equipment and they can be at different heights, different sizes, different configurations. So that's just a small snapshot and examples of why you would be looking at these types of uh, uh, possible upgrades and they don't have to be big lots of money. It could be as little or as much as you want, but it's mm. it's helping to really uh, cater for a lot more scope within those um, areas. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I feel like uh, across the industry, particularly on the investor side of things, there's a tendency to put participants in boxes and say, you know, this all participants in this category are alike when it's a lot more dynamic than that with individual participants operating on a spectrum of what they can do, what their lifestyle's like, what how their disability affects them. And depending on the sorts of participants that you actually get in your property, you would um, there'd be a lot of variation, which obviously if things are in a in a space where they're more functional and accessible, as you mentioned, that obviously you know, opens the door to a greater lifestyle for a greater number of participants. Absolutely. We've had situations where clients, if they they find that they can't meet their needs within that space, then they're looking around to move somewhere that will meet their needs. So that means exactly. there's a lot of inconvenience for the clients, there's a lot of inconvenience uh, for the providers, but there's also a huge impact on the investors of this space. So for example, if someone relocates because they're not happy within that space or it's not meeting their needs for whatever a number of those reasons, right, Mm. that it's costing the investor because when you have an empty space, that is income that is not being generated within that space. Exactly. So it's really important that you work towards um, having better facilities and then making sure your clients are very happy within those facilities because then it's a stable environment. And the last thing, which is an important part, is reputational value. If you yep. have a reputation of clients moving in and out and, and that particular facility not meeting the needs uh, of the participant, well, Raises that questions. can also have a, a huge effect as well. Hmm. Um, so I suppose uh, uh, on a kind of a more uh, practical basis, if, if I'm an investor and I'm thinking about adding in a few extra additions, what sort of money should I say put aside or you know maybe think that I might need um, to kind of take take this into consideration and maybe um, you know uh, start to put this into potentially what I'd be building at the end of the day? Yeah um, good question and as I touched on before is that, it could be something minimal. It could be something as little as three or four thousand um, dollars. And if you wanted to do some additional fit outs and some other major things in a number of areas, it could be fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. But it doesn't have to be that high. It could be very strategic, depending upon the clients that you're looking to um, attract within that space. But awesome. will it make a div- big difference? Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. That's really good advice. Yeah. So I suppose uh, just uh, wrapping up, um, is there any kind of final pieces of advice that you'd give to uh, investors who are looking to potentially put these variations into their house? Mm, Yeah, very much so. Do your homework. Really um, um, look for companies that have been um, in the space for a long, long time who know what they're doing within this environment. Work with those. Um, as mentioned previously, um, not everyone who's working within the space at the moment has got the longevity and the knowledge and the experience, so mm. that's why it's critical to do that. Um, and, and the other really important thing at the moment is because the space is now um, fairly new still, is mm. that it's really yep. important to make sure that Uh, we all help one another within the space. And that means, um, and for builders and investors and all the stakeholders, developers, everyone, architects, designers, if they're not sure, put your hand up, find out, work with people that know what they're doing um, because it's all about outcomes. 
and the, the better the outcome, that's really what this is all about. And then you have uh, a very good reputation of, of building and having good products. Um, and so your investment, when you're doing SDAs, the monetary value is really important, but there's also another intrinsic value of really looking after the clients that these spaces are specifically being built for. And that's a critical factor as well. And I think um, it's really important for the developers and the builders to really understand that's why building quality product within this space plays such an integral part because these homes are meant to be there for such a long period of time. And as it, and I'll touch base on something which someone mentioned before, which is also the regional spaces. Yep. yep. And there is a lot going on in those spaces. At the moment for SDA builds, we've been advised and told by a number of investors that due to the massive increases in real estate costings and um, limited land um, spaces and what have you, that there's a lot more investment in to a number of regional areas. And there's some fabulous spaces that Absolutely. this is about. And if you look at, you know, there's far north Queensland, there's a lot going on up there in various parts there. You've got regional New South Wales, it could Absolutely. be the mid-north coast. Yeah, You've we got... have a number of properties actually in uh, regional New South Wales, which are kind of in the villa villa kind of category or units, uh, which would suit, you know, if you're outfitting a number of different individual villas in a, a location, they can obviously, it's kind of economical to do that all at once in terms mm. of um, having that all as part of a pack of, of villas. So, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, regional regional spaces look can be very, very good. The network of um, uh, people that are in that space, um, what you're trying to find. I think traditionally in the past, maybe some of the regional areas have, have been uh, really not looked after as well as they mm. could have been, you know, and, and it's just fabulous to see that some of the... Some of the developers are really reviewing this very seriously within this space. And of course, we know that in recent times, and that's part of the pandemic and everything else, that people want to be able to re move more into regional areas. That means sometimes yep. their loved ones might want to relocate as well. So there's all sorts of opportunities within those spaces and just great communities being built up within those areas, which is really important. Yep, absolutely. Well, thanks, uh, Kim, for coming in today and telling us a little bit about inclusive living. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. And if anyone wants to re review any of our products, you can go to www.inclusiveliving.com.au and, and you can also contact us via that website as well. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Cheers for now. Bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure that you are subscribed and following us so that you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this episode with those that can benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode. Thank you.